So 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much just for this morning and giving us this great opportunity, Lord, to come together as your church, Lord, to study your word, to worship you. Um, Lord, in the midst of everything that is going on and we can easily be distracted and um, distraught and uh, disgruntled and disheartened, Lord, um, discouraged, we know that Uh, You are here with your Holy Spirit, the great comforter, the one to encourage us that our hope is not in anything else but Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, as we open up your word, I pray that we would hold on to that hope as we study. Lord, as we would allow your Holy Spirit to do his work as he teaches us and guides us through your word, to fill me with your spirit, to speak your words that you have for all of us here this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just realized my notes are in the back. One second. I look down and I'm like, wait a second. Something's missing here. <laughs> uh, well, Second Thessalonians 3, um, starting in verse 6. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person, then do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, I think if you've been around any time at all, you know that people love easy, right? They love the tips and the tricks and the ways to get something without doing anything. Um, in fact, if you uh, to go on YouTube or social media or on the internet, it's always like how to earn money in your sleep, how to do this. How to, and it's just all these ways that we can do, get things without doing anything. Um, that's our culture, especially now, you know, we, with all this technology and everything, you know, we're trying to, as much as we can to be able to get things without doing anything. So in fact, um, uh, I work at a credit union and so this past couple weeks has been a little crazy on the phones with the new stimulus check coming in. Um, and it's just been so crazy to me how people think with the stimulus check as they're entitled to it, as if they logged their hours at work and why isn't that stimulus check in their account right now? Um, and it's just as if they've earned it and they're entitled to it. Um, unfortunately, in the church, there are many people who can act like this, lazy. They want to get something without doing anything. Um, in fact, there's many, unfortunately, in the churches. And when I say in the churches, I mean corporately as a building, not the church, the body of Christ, although they certainly like to come in as wolves among sheep. And they're con artists. And they take advantage of people in the church for their own personal gain. Um, I've shared this story once or twice. But when I was uh, at Bible college, I remember that um, people really took advantage of the fact that you're in Bible college. And so um, if you had a car, uh, people really loved to ask you. I didn't have a car, so I was actually one of these people that asked. Um, (laughs) But if someone had a car, people love to ask you if they could get a ride somewhere. Because you're at Bible college, why would you say no to someone? 
You know, that's not the Christian thing to do. <laughs> if you went off campus and you went and got food and you brought it back on campus and you're sitting in a common area and I'm um, like me, I love Oreos. So I remember I had Oreos and I'd have them and, and people would walk up and they would just, some people would just help themselves. And as they're helping themselves, you know, they put their arm around you and they're just like, you know, hey Nick, how's it going? And I'm like, um, my, I'm eating my Oreos is what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> Can I help you with, with anything? And, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Do you mind if I have one? Well, you already have touched three, so you can take those three, um, and that'll be enough for you. But people love to take advantage of these situations of churches. I've seen it being in church myself. Um, I remember when um, I was a, a youth pastor out in California, there was a, a new person that had come to church and me and a couple of the other assistant pastors, when there's new people, you know, we like to go and introduce ourselves, see them. This person seemed a little out there, a little odd. And so we noted them and we went up to talk to them after service. Um, after service, he was very blunt and I, I, we were very surprised because um, he said, yeah, I like to go around to different churches and tell people about my music ministry and see if they'll financially support me. And I, you know, I went to some other churches and they, they didn't. And so, you know, obviously they're not, you know, with the Lord and, you know, they're not following after him of love and kindness. And I said, well, we, me and um, uh, my friend who I was with, we said, you know, I don't know if this is the church then for you either because <laughs> um, uh, we're not supposed to be badgering people uh, for money um, if, if that's the case. So, um, but it, it's just, it's so sad to see it, right? Um, I mean, we could look and point our fingers at the, the televangelists, right? And say, well, yeah, those guys are the con artists. Those guys are the people trying to take your money, you know. Um, but there are so many others that aren't on TV that try and do the same thing. Um, and that's kind of what Paul is going to be speaking about this morning. And as Christians, the only gain that we should look for is for the advancing of the kingdom of Christ, not our own personal gain, especially for things here on this earth. So going back to verse 6, Paul says, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Now let's get some context here because you read this verse and you're like, whoa, Paul, harsh. You're telling people to not hang out with other people. You're telling people to withdraw from others, to excommunicate others. That seems pretty harsh. Well, if we remember the context of what's been going on in this letter and, and 1 Thessalonians is also very important to 2 Thessalonians. Um, they were written not too far from each other to really the same group of people who were dealing with a lot of the same issues. And what Paul has been doing is encouraging the church that even though the times are tough and even though they're going through persecutions and trials, that they should still serve and follow the Lord and let the Lord do His work in them. Another thing he was encouraging them is that they had not missed the return of the Lord. At the beginning of this letter, we see that they um, got scared. They thought they missed his, se his second coming. So they missed out on it. And Paul says, no, 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 that hasn't happened. What's happening, you, you're not in the great tribulation. He goes, in, in, in a way, he basically says, you would know if you're in the great tribulation. You're not going to have to guess. And so he tells them, look, continue to serve the Lord. Even though it's tough, continue to serve him. And it seems though, as he says a lot of that in his first letter, it seems some took that exhortation of the Lord's coming back soon, that he hasn't come back yet. They took that exhortation a little too far and decided to just stop working and becoming, as Paul says here, a busybody and disorderly. They just stopped working. Well, the Lord's coming back, so what's the point? Why should I go to my nine to five? What's the point? Why should I pay my mortgage? What's the point? And I've heard many people say that. I'm not going to get a 30-year a fixed mortgage on, on my house because the Lord will come back before then. I mean, he could. Or maybe he comes back 31 years from now. <laughs> but they kind of just gave up. And so Paul here tells them, we, we command you. Again, this isn't just like a, hey, you know, you should pray about this. I'm not really sure if this will work out for you guys or not. You know, see how, see how you can implement. He says, we command you. 
speaking of himself and Timothy and Silas, the, his companions with him. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, not in the name of Paul, not in the name of, you know, the church of Jerusalem, but in the name of the Lord, we command you to withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly. Verse 7, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we, we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For some, and I, I've spoken to people like this, they, they look at the end times and they say, well, again, what's the point? It's all going to, one thing we can tell from the Bible, the end times will happen exactly as the Lord has prescribed it to. And then from that point, I guess it's up to what your interpretation of what that is. And that's okay. We, we can disagree on those, those small, small issues. That's fine. But one thing is for sure, the Lord is coming back and he's coming back soon. And our view of the end times will always affect how we live our lives. You know, I, I've, I've had conversations with people who disagree with my view of the end times. And, and one thing that I've always been encouraged with most of the conversations, not all, but most that I've had with people who disagree, is that we both agree that in the end, we're focusing on Jesus and that he's coming back. We're not trying to figure out, we mentioned this in, first and second, in, in this letter as well, we're not trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. We're not trying to figure out what the mark of the beast is. We're not trying to figure out what that angel with all those different heads and what those, we're not trying to figure that out. We're just looking to Jesus, as Hebrews says, the author and finisher of our faith. We're looking for him to come back for us. All that other stuff is just incidental. Again, the Lord will have it figured out. There's not going to be a pop quiz when you get into heaven to say, you know, what did Ezekiel really see? But we're supposed to look to Christ. And so our view of the end times will always affect how we live our lives. And, and I'll tell you this, there's, there's people who believe that Jesus Christ is coming back soon, but I don't think they believe that Jesus Christ is coming back soon. They just believe the world's going to end soon. And when you, and there's a big difference when you believe that Jesus Christ is coming back soon, you're going to be like the parable of, of the ten virgins who have their oils and lamps ready for when he returns. And as Paul has been encouraging the church throughout these two letters, they're going to continue to serve the Lord. It's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be something where they're having to twist their arm to do it, but it's something that you continue to do because you know he's coming back for you. But then there's others who just think, yeah, the world's going to end and it's going to end by fire. The Lord's going to do it. So again, what's the point of doing anything? Why serve the Lord? Or maybe not why serve the Lord, but why, go, why, why do anything here on this earth? You know, there's, there's certainly a lot of people out there um, that you, you've probably seen on TV, the preppers, you know, doomsday preppers with their bunkers in the hills and their... 80,000, you know, cream, can of cream corn <laughs> and, um, you know, that the toilet paper crisis probably put a dent in their supply for the, for the year, but that's okay. They're, they're stocking the shelves again so they can get more. And obviously our view of the end times will affect how we live our lives. Where we're going will affect how we get there. And for these people in the church at Thessalonica, it stopped them from doing anything productively. Notice what Paul said in the first letter. They obviously didn't read this part, but, you know, there's a lot in the Bible people read with their eyes, just they don't understand it, I guess, in their heart or minds. He says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 10 through 12, but we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you that you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. And so he tells them you need to work. But see there in verse six, we again, we saw something that is a touchy subject in the church, but it's very clear in scripture. He tells them to withdraw from those that walk disorderly. 
And again, it seems harsh. It seems as though it shouldn't be that way. Shouldn't we just as the church, kumbaya, no matter what's going on, just always accept everyone? And that's the narrative that gets pushed right now, right? I mean, it's sad, it's sad that churches have to put out there everyone welcome. I, I mean, I, I've read the Bible. Everyone is welcome to come to the Lord. All who call on the name of Jesus will be saved. None will be turned away. But when they're calling on the name of the Lord, they're denouncing their sinful lifestyle, whatever it was. So yes, everyone is welcome. But everyone's welcome to come in humility, not in pride. And, and I'll say this, especially in our culture, in our churches today, most of the time in our churches today, we just mind our own business, right? We just, we, we might know someone's going through something. Maybe it's their struggle. Maybe we know someone's living in sin in some way, shape, or form. That it's, there's a sin in their life that's got a hold of them. And you know what we love to do in our culture? Just mind our own business. That's, that's between them and the Lord. We'll let them work it out. But see, the problem is, again, that's, that goes into what our view of church is. If our view of church is this social gathering where we come together and we all just sing the same songs and listen to the same person speak, well, I mean, th there's concerts for that if you want to do that. There's TED Talks for that if that's what you want to do. But see, that's not what the church is. The church is a body of Christ. We're all part of the same body working for the same goal, the advancement of the kingdom of God. And so when someone has their own problems and they're part of the body, it's causing the body problems. Your back is just one part of your body, right? It's not your whole body. Your whole body's not just a back. But when your back goes out, how much of the rest of your body can function well? Not very well. Your foot, right? If you're, you twist your ankle right now, there's going to be a lot of limitations on the rest of your body. Your eyes, I mean, there's, I mean, I can, we could spend all morning talking about all the different things that the, the one little thing in your body that doesn't function correctly, that affects the rest of the body. And so it's not just their problems or their business, but it's the body's business because we're all part of that same body. And in fact, going back to the anatomy, there's a lot of parts of the body that when it's down and out, it requires another part of the body to come and help it, to compensate or to lift it up. God is, I mean, I failed anatomy class, so <laughs> don't take my word for it. <laughs> but I'll tell you this, what I did pay attention to, um, man, God has done some amazing things in creating us when it comes to the body. And there's no mistake when he calls the church the body of Christ. It's not just a fun little picture we can have and teach our kids about. I mean, there's a lot to learn. In fact, I know in, in this room today, we have a lot of medical students or people in the medical field. And um, I'm glad you passed anatomy and I didn't have to. So I can listen to all the good stuff when I talk to you about it. But man, there's a lot that the Lord does. But going back to withdrawing from our brothers, this is something clear in scripture. In fact, Jesus himself, yes, Jesus. This isn't just mean Paul. A lot of people like to separate Paul and Jesus. Like, yeah, Paul is really mean, but I like to listen to Jesus, the grace and peace and everything. Um, Jesus in Matthew 18 actually lays out the groundwork for how we're to deal with someone who's living in sin. He says there, first, if, some, if your brother offends you, his brother's in sin, you go to them and you confront them. And the whole point is that they would repent in turn, right? Say, hey, you're living in sin, you're hurting the body, and um, you, know, you want to repent from this. Most of the time, I'll tell you this, most of the time that works. But there are times when it doesn't. So he says, then what you do is they don't want to listen. They still don't want to repent. They don't want to reconcile. You bring in a witness, someone else to come with you and confront that brother or sister again. They look, brother or sister, you're living in sin. There's some sin in your life and it's not just affecting you. It's affecting the body of Christ. Will you repent from this? Again, at that point, you would hope they'd still listen. 
Um, I've seen, in, in the few times I've seen this played out, I've seen that they typically don't listen. Even at, you know, if they're not listening to the first time, they're usually going to hold steady till the end, unfortunately. But hey, the, Lord's, the Lord works, and maybe in His grace, he'll, that person will repent. If they still refuse to, then, Jesus says, then you bring it up to, to the church. And if they're still not willing to repent, you withdraw that brother or sister from the church. No longer to, be, to have fellowship. Right? Jesus even said, if your eye causes you to sin, cut it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And when you're looking at the, the pictures of the body of Christ, if they're continuing to sin and sin and sin, it needs to be dealt with. Now, these people in Thessalonica, they were becoming burdens to the church because they did not work. And instead, they relied on other people to take care of them. Again, just like the gentleman I told you about in our church, going to church and church just asking people to take care of him. But what does Paul say in these verses? In verse 7, he says, You know how you ought to follow us. We weren't disorderly. Verse 8, We didn't eat anyone's bread free of charge. We worked night and day. And then in verse 9, he says, It's not because we, we had to. He goes, We actually had authority to say you guys should support us. And this is the really interesting thing about Paul. Paul actually in the Bible, he's the one that, that writes all about how churches need to provide for their pastors. Which is so interesting because he refused to take any support from his churches. And yet he said, look, don't necessarily follow what I do in this sense, but I'm letting you churches know that for those who are working for the gospel, you should provide for them. So that way they can focus on the gospel. But Paul says, but you know what? You don't have to do that for me. I'm going to make sure that... And it's just a really, really interesting um, balance there. Because I've seen some who come in and they demand, as, as a pastor or they're serving at the church, they demand that the church take care of them. They want to look at the benefits package. Well, will you have a parking space for me? Can I have a church car? Um, is there a place where you guys will put me up? I mean, just all these things. And you know, if you don't have that, then I'm sorry. I'm out of here. Then there's others who won't take anything from the church and then they work themselves to death trying to provide for their family that they can't focus on the church. But see, Paul shows us that we shouldn't be forcing the church to provide for us. We should be willing to work. But as the church, we should be willing to take care of those who work for the gospel. Interesting balance that Paul gives in, in his life. Um, and, and I'll tell you this too. There are some that... Um, I know one friend of mine who's a missionary in the Middle East. Um, he's, got, he, he, he's got something worked out where he doesn't need to take any money from any ministry because he's taken care of from the job he used to work at. Um, he, in fact, I, I went, went, went out and got coffee and he got mad that I bought him coffee because like, I don't need your money. I don't need your help. And I was like, man, that's refreshing. <laughs> And so Paul tells them they needed to work for their food. Verse 10, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. Again, Paul's harsh. If anyone doesn't work, neither shall they eat. Now, that's not speaking of people who can't work. There are certainly people who are in a, a position where they can't work. They're physically dis, you know, incapable of doing it. That's not what he's speaking of here. He's speaking of the people who have chosen not to work and are chosen people to take care of. You know, the church needs to take care of me. And in fact, there are many today that believe it's the church's duty to provide for them. Again, the church should be helping, but we shouldn't be demanding the church to provide for us. Others, and I've seen this, others, and this is kind of the cloak of holiness that they have, 
They sit on their hands and wait for the Lord to provide when the Lord has provided them an opportunity to work. (laughs) And I've seen this happen. And he says here, people who are disorderly, people who live like this are disorderly. They're busybodies. Now, busybodies doesn't seem like that bad of a thing, right? We know busybodies. They're the people that are constantly talking about others. They're gossiping. They're, again, they're not doing anything. They, they look like they're busy. They act like they're busy, but they're not doing anything. Notice what Peter says about busybodies in 1 Peter 4, chapter chapter 4 verse 15 he goes but let none of you suffer as a murderer that's pretty bad right I think that's a good thing don't be a murderer don't be a thief is what he says next an evildoer I mean I'm glad we're all not that right murderers thieves evildoers or as a busybody in other people's matters I mean murderer thief evildoer I get that Peter busybody that's pretty harsh Peter lumps busybody in, gossiper in, in the same breath as a murderer, as a thief. And he tells them instead they should work in quietness and eat their own bread. Quite frankly, this just means that we do the work that we have to do. We talked about this again in 1 Thessalonians 4, how we're to live a quiet and orderly life. A disorder, and again, when we talked about that, we talked about how that doesn't mean that you're the most organized person. I am not that at all. That doesn't mean that, you know, you're just quiet and you're in the back and you're just the cog in the machine, man, or anything like that. But that just means that you don't live a life where the Lord's name would be blasphemed. But instead, we should work in quietness and eat our own bread. Now, verse 13. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now, I'm actually very encouraged. You know, I'm going through this passage, studying for it, and I'm like, you know what? I don't really, you know, maybe I, I don't know of anyone personally in our church that is going through this, where they're just sitting around demanding the church provide for them, and I'm thankful for that. Um, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Paul encourages those that aren't being busybodies, again, to continue and not grow weary in doing good. In fact, in Galatians 6, 9, he says the same thing to the church in Galatia. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And the picture here and, is that we're not going to get everything right here and now. You know, it's really easy to look at the people that are taking advantage and conning the system and to see their rewards because it's happening right away. An easy return, a fast return on their investment, right? Right? And be like, well, Lord, I've been doing good. And I haven't gotten that return on that investment. In fact, I think they they put out recently that in that first round of stimulus checks back in April, I think 30, in between that and the PPP loans and everything, 34 billion, I think was the number, was uh, the amount of fraud that happened. 34 billion with a B, billion, 34 a number none of us will ever see, nor could we think of, but we'll say it, 34 billion in fraud? I mean, it's ridiculous, right? And and it should be so easy for us to say, well, Lord, I've worked this whole time, and I still, and I got those stimulus checks, and I still had trouble. I still struggled. And yet there's people applying for PPP. There was a guy in Florida who bought a Lamborghini. Good thing they caught him, right? But I mean, you could look at that and be like, my car just broke down. (laughs) And this dude's buying a Lamborghini. 
Lord, what am I doing wrong? (laughs) It's easy to look at what others are doing and be discouraged. I know I can fall into that sometimes. Especially for myself with the idol of quote unquote full time ministry. You know, I, I see this a lot when I talk to different pastors or leaders in the church. And um, my, myself, I'm bivocational. I, I have a full time job um, aside from this. And um, I talk to others who are in the same boat as me. And sometimes it's interesting to see the idol of full time. You know, one day I'll work enough and then finally I'll be full time ministry. Well, let me tell you, all ministry is full-time, whether you're being paid for it or not. <laughs> and when you stop, start seeing that and stop remembering that, you know, that, hey, I am full-time doing this. This isn't a part-time gig for me. It's not a part-time gig for you being full-time. I've seen that in churches where there's, you know, I've been part of bigger churches where there's a paid staff. And then you have the volunteers that come in on a Sunday or a Wednesday and the volunteers say, well, you know what? I'll leave this mess for the paid staff because that's what they get paid to do. I don't get paid to do that. I'm volunteering my time. They should be lucky to have me. Read the story of Gideon. You'll see that God doesn't need you. God doesn't need your gifts and talents and numbers. and he doesn't need any of that. He wants the glory from, in fact, he wants you if you can't do it, (laughs) almost. That's what it seems, right? Not always the case, but certainly because he wants the glory. And I can fall into that uh, that idolatry sometimes. Oh, man. Man, you know, if I was full-time right now, this would be so much easier and blah, blah, blah. I need to teach, I need to, I know, maybe I'll do a series on how they support the pastor. Yeah, that'd be good, you know. That'd be good, you know. Put a thermometer up on the back and, you know. I'll make sure my kids show up in, like, raggedy clothes and, uh, you know, just like, uh, poor Pastor Nick. Like, uh, you know. And the Lord slaps you. Get out of there. Stop that. I'm sorry. Okay. I repent. So, brethren, don't grow weary in doing good. And he says again, he reiterates, verse 14, note that person if they don't obey this. Don't keep company with them that they may be ashamed. But look at verse 15, yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. And this man, when you can read Paul's letters, you can see that he's, he can be pretty harsh to people in terms of telling them to withdraw, to, to note that person. Telling that, that, you know, that person needs to, to give that po- person over to Satan is what he says in one letter. Give that person who, over to Satan. If they want to continue to live a sinful life, give that person over to them. And it seems harsh to withdraw from people. To, it seems harsh to have church discipline. In fact, there are many churches today that church discipline is not even a thought because they don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. But Paul here says that church discipline is not to humiliate anyone. It's not to make anyone else look good or make someone look bad. The whole purpose of church discipline of withdrawing from someone, of of confronting someone in their sin, is to admonish that person. The purpose of it is to help them turn from their ways. And we have two examples of this um, or encouragements of this in the New Testament. First in James chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. This is how James ends his epistle. His whole epistle on, you know, faith is by works. And without works, your faith is dead. And he says, brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. He's telling him, if you see someone wandering in sin, we should want to go and turn that brother or sister back from the error of their ways. And then Paul in Galatians 6, verses 1 through 5, he says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one, notice this, in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. 
But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for each one shall bear his own load. The point of church discipline is restoration. It's reconciliation. In fact, I, I've noted that um, even when Paul calls people out by name, his whole point is that they would be restored. And you know, and, and I say this because there are some in the church that like almost feed off of church discipline. You, you have the ones who like will never do church discipline because they don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. And then you have the others that are like, they're looking for you to take a step out of line so they can discipline you church style. <laughs> so they can name you amongst the wolves. And they have their names for themselves. They think they're doing a service or a ministry. But the whole, there's never a point for restoration or reconciliation. Even the people that Paul named by name, he knew. He's not just name dropping people to you know, get more likes on his posts or people to follow his blogs or something like that. He had a genuine care for those people. He wanted to see them restored to Christ. Yet do not count him as an enemy. And again, I see so many in the church. I mean, the world looks at us and laughs at us, right? Just, just a few weeks ago, there was a famous pastor out of New York City who um, admitted to having multiple affairs in, in, a very, in a worldwide church. And man, I'll tell you, the people that have been attacking them and that church and stuff, most of the attacks, you know where they're coming from? the church and the world is sitting back saying we don't even have to call them out on their hypocrisy they're showing it themselves the whole point is for restoration the whole point is for reconciliation it's not to prove you're better or they're any worse than you they're not your enemy they're your brother in Christ they're your sister in Christ I pray as a church, we'll never have to be in a situation where we have to use church discipline. But I also know that as a church, there's people here. And it's probably going to happen. And so for me, I know that I pray for strength, for love, for wisdom to do it. It's not an easy thing to do as a pastor or as a church leadership. I know our church leadership, we, we will not feel good about ever having to do this. But we also understand it's commanded. And if we have to, we will. But we pray for the strength, love, and wisdom to do it. And then we pray for grace on the other person that they would repent. Because that's the whole point. This isn't a, an exclusive club. <laughs> if it was, none of us would deserve to be here. but we do it so that others would repent. In fact, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 that Christ has reconciled us to God. And because he's done that, that he's now given us, all who believe in him, that ministry of reconciliation. Well, what's my ministry? It's to reconcile others to God. Whether that be them a, a lost soul and bringing them to Christ, or maybe that's someone in the church who's, who's walked away or is going down a path or is taken over in a trespass. Every job is a believer. And that's not a job for the pastor. I'll let the pastors do it. Because what does James say? Brethren, if anyone among you, if anyone among you turns a sinner, turns a want, among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, This is a job for all this. Oh, that's, you know, that's the pa pastor gets paid to do that, right? It's not my job. It's not my ministry. In Matthew 18, again, Jesus is speaking to everyone, not just leaders in the church. You go to your brother first. 
And then in verse 16, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You know, Paul opens this letter just as he, or closes this letter just as he opened it with grace and peace from the Lord. The Lord of peace himself give you peace always. And this should be the ground that the Thess- the ground that the Thessalonians need to do what they need to do. Grace and peace. Grace from the Lord and peace from God. And this is what should ground us as his people. His grace, his peace. That we now have peace with God. We're no longer his enemy, but we're now his sons and daughters. And so as we close this letter, we can see that one thing's for sure, Christ is coming back for his church. One thing is also for sure, we're going to suffer trials and tribulations and persecutions because the servant is not greater than his master. And if they hated him, they're going to hate us if we preach his message. If the, the world is accepting of our message, it's not his message. And that should, because he's coming back and he's coming back soon, that should cause us to be ready. But how can we be ready? We can do it by faithfully serving him and whatever he has for us. Not being busybodies, not being idle, not being disorderly, but following after him. Do not grow weary in doing good. And and brothers and sisters, I'll tell you, it's tiring, especially in our culture now, especially with what's been going on around us. but you know what? We have hope. These other people that are getting rich quick and doing all these schemes and con artists and fraudsters, they have no hope. That's why they're doing it. They're hoping in those things, but those things will never last. Even if they lasted in their lifetime, that's it. What we have lasts much greater. The treasures we store up Thieves can't break in and steal. Moth and rust cannot destroy. And so we should not grow weary in doing good. And I think I'd be amiss to now give anyone an opportunity to repent. Maybe you're, maybe you're not saved. Maybe you have no hope. Well, you have a chance right now to turn to him. And why should you? Well, it's because he's loved you. He loves you. He sent his son to die for you because what you've been doing your whole life is trying to work out your own salvation, trying to figure it out, trying to earn enough, but it'll never be enough. In fact, he earned it for you. And he says, all you need to do is to repent from your sins and turn to him. And no one's turned away who turns to the Father. Or maybe you're a believer and you've been walking down a path. Well, I, take this opportunity right now. I'm admonishing you as a brother, not an enemy, to turn from your trespasses, turn from your sins. Stop walking disorderly. And whatever that sin might be, confess it to your Father. For He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins when we confess them to Him. And I would even encourage you, if you've done that this morning, to after service, speak to someone about it. Find a friend that they'll admonish you as a brother as well. You'll see if you're not an enemy. So Lord, we thank you so much for that salvation that you give us, that hope that you give us, that no matter what we've done, Lord, you've done something so much greater that'll always outweigh all the bad that we've done, all the bad that we're going to continue to do, all the sin that still permeates this body, Lord. But we have a hope that one day we know that you are coming back to take us from here to to be in glory with you where there's no more sin, there's no more pain, there's no more struggling, Lord. But we'll be made perfect and complete. 
So Lord, I pray for anyone right now that doesn't know you, they would turn to you by the work of your Holy Spirit, Lord. I also pray for those that are believers that maybe are, are walking down a path they shouldn't. That they would take this moment right now by the conviction of your Holy Spirit, Lord. They would turn to you. They would repent of that. And they would stop walking disorderly and start walking orderly. Lord, we thank you that you even give us that opportunity. And Lord, help us to not grow weary in doing good. Lord, you've given us your Holy Spirit to give us strength, to guide us, to provide for us, to comfort us, to give us peace. So, Lord, I pray we would be, just be filled with your spirit to walk in wherever you have for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.